Moderna announced on Wednesday that the company is ready for the FDA to give emergency authorization for its COVID vaccine to children under the age of six. Well, let's break this down with our next guest, Dr. Jeremy Faust, Brigham and Women's Hospital Emergency Medicine Physician and Editor-in-Chief of MedPage Today. Thank you for joining us. Now, it's interesting. It looked as though Pfizer would reach this milestone first, but they had to delay after disappointing data against the Omicron variant. What do we know about Moderna's study and findings and that have it planning for this emergency youth authorization now? Thanks for having me. I think this is great news. I think that Pfizer and Moderna both took a similar approach, but if you get in the weeds, you can understand why they've had some differences. Pfizer elected to go with a dose that was one-tenth of the adult dose for the youngest children, going down to six months of age, up to age five. Moderna did a quarter dose, one twenty-five percent of their adult dose for six months up to age six. So quite frankly, Moderna just went with a higher dose on the thought that the risk benefit would favor that, and it seems to have worked so far. So we saw that Pfizer did not reach its endpoints, which was antibody levels that imply protection, and now they're going to study a third dose. And finally, Moderna, though, has come through here today, we hope, we think, with from this press release, with data to suggest that kids six months to age six are getting excellent antibody protection and some degree of protection against infection, even during the Omicron era. So I think that's really excellent news. It's the news that many um, observers and parents like myself have been waiting to hear. Doc, there's a lot of fatigue out there for COVID right now. How how much do you think hesitancy will play in parents getting their kids vaccinated? And how far are we from legitimately having that shot in our kids' arms? I think it can come in the spring. That's what I'm hoping for. In terms of hesitancy, you are correct. There has been a lot of hesitancy in the older kids. Look, the Pfizer vaccine is authorized for our children age five and up. And we, we have great data to suggest it works. We have observational data from after the trials to suggest that not only does it work the way that the research was intended to work, but also in addition to that, all of the hopes about protection against severe disease and hospitalization and complications, this, this inflammatory condition that can happen in kids, all those things have played out well for Pfizer. So the strategy of using antibody levels in kids as a proxy for clinical outcomes in the trials, that worked for Pfizer. Nevertheless, hesitancy has been so low. It's, it's disappointing. You've got slam dunk data in the New England Journal of Medicine and in the CDC's really rigorous journals showing that it works for kids five and up, and yet rates are really low. So I'm glad that we, we waited until we got great data for under five and under six because parents aren't even really doing it for the kids in whom we have great data for older. So I think that the way to do this is just time and, and continue to have the conversations. Parents trust their pediatricians. Yearly visits are going to be a place where this is going to be brought up. And eventually, like all other, va other vaccines, it's going to be a thing that's associated with going back to school. So I think that's how we get there. I think there's been a lot of misinformation, but when we have good information, high quality data, that's, uh, that can move the ball forward. So that's what today is really about. Dr. Faust, switching gears here, how concerned are you over the spread of the BA2 subvariant of Omicron? And do you think it could set off an at least temporary disruption to the reopening, like we saw with Omicron at the beginning of this year? I do not know what will happen with BA2. I think that we just endured this terrible Omicron wave in the winter. And to some extent, we might have some tail of protection from that. Like we have people who are more vaccinated, more boosted, and on, on top of it, all of these people walking around with some degree of protection from, from Omicron and whatever they might have had from previous infections. We are unfortunately, unfortunately, a very uh, immune population compared to where we were a year ago. Are we immune enough? That will really depend on how contagious this variant is, how much cross reactivity there is between the strain that was here in January, February and March and this new one. And to some extent, factors that are completely random and hard to predict, such as weather or people's behavior or how well masking works, two way masking, one way masking. So it is impossible to predict w whether these models that you see are going to be accurate or not. But what is absolutely certain is that how we prepare and how we act will change the outcome. So having congressional funding disappear for vaccination, for having congressional funding disappear for therapeutics that we know are improving outcomes and not getting masks into people's hands and rapid tests at home, those are the things that 
we will really regret because if this variant does cause any problem at all, we will wish we'd done more. So I, I don't know how bad it will be, but I know that we can control it with all that we have learned so far. And, and as we look at what happened with Moderna, now these were findings that were released uh, via press release, not published in a medical journal. But as you take a holistic view as, as ways to battle COVID, how important is this part of it versus, say, some of the progress that we're seeing in treatments, especially for some of these long haul COVID people? This has been like a couple of years of people still living with this condition. I think vaccination is not the only way out of this pandemic, but I think it's the it's the chief one, it's the primary one, because preventing disease is far better than trying to treat it. And we know that's, that's the case for so many diseases. We also are seeing some signals. It's hard to study this, but I think we're going to learn more as very serious researchers study this question. How much does the vaccine not only prevent death, hospitalization, and other severe consequences, but also things like long COVID syndromes? I think the answer is it probably does. And I think it probably does, probably does very, very well. But we, we have to define those questions very carefully and study it rigorously. So I think that the great thing about vaccinating everybody is that you get a, a huge outcome for so many different readouts not just death, not just case counts, but everything in between. So I think it's a huge part of ending the emergency phase of this crisis is vaccination. At the same time, I think that we still need to have that funding for the next phase, for getting to what my colleague Zeke Emanuel calls next normal. So that means having better surveillance and having faster responses in terms of if you test positive, you know exactly where to go to get a therapeutic so that the outcomes are as, as, as good as we can achieve with with you know, the improvements in science that are coming on a weekly, daily, monthly basis. Doc, does that next normal include annual COVID vaccine shots? It very well could. And I think that that's something the public will probably have some appetite for, as opposed to chronically having boosters every four to six months. I think that to some people will do that and they'll need to do that. And, and high risk people uh, will study who, who that is and, and, and try to sort that out. But I think that we do annual flu shots. We, we can now anticipate it's possible that we would do an annual COVID shot. It might be similar to how we do flu shot in terms of it might be a different formulation from year to year to get at variants. Right now, we're still using the original recipe, if you will. We haven't moved over to any variant-specific uh, vaccines. It's possible that future vaccines, a seasonal vaccine, might be a different platform altogether, which would be better at preventing disease, uh, symptomatic infection as opposed to the serious disease, which is what these vaccines that we have now are really designed to do. They do happen to decrease infection and transmission somewhat. But I think that you could get what we call a mucosal vaccine. These are uh, like a nasal vaccine that are really designed to um, keep uh, infections uh, down. So I think there's a lot to learn in, in the coming months and years. I suspect that we will get a lot better at this. All right, we'll leave it there for now. Dr. Jeremy Faust, Brigham and Women's Hospital Emergency Medicine Physician and Editor-in-Chief of MedPage Today. Thank you so much. Thank you.